to you all. Um, who's up for a good day? Put your hand up if you're up for a good day. Okay, wiggle it about. Now, now keep it up, keep it up, keep it wiggling. Fine. Now lower it gently onto the knee of the person you're sitting next to. <laughs> Give it a squeeze and say, I hope you're up for a good day too. Okay. There's a guy over there who thinks it's Christmas. <laughs> A couple of guys at the back having a broke back mountain moment, but anyway, we'll, we'll let them get on with it. Are there any men here, actually? Put your hand up if you're a man. Yeah. Okay. Jesus. <laughs> Round of applause for the men. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Right. Now I know what it feels like. Um, listen, I, you'll be pleased to know that I know nothing about midwifery, Okay. And I don't give a toss, really, so I'm not, I'm, I don't think I'm going to be bothered to talk to you about it. Uh, so what I thought I'd do is I'd uh, talk, <laughs> talk about, don't worry, Chairman. Um, uh, I th- what I thought I'd do is I'd, I thought I'd talk to you about my, uh, my favourite topic, which is really the history of art. Um, who's up for a bit of history of art? Put your hand up a bit of history of art. Yeah, you don't want to do midwifery, do you? So here we go. This is now, it's unfortunately, not a very good reproduction because... Uh, uh, Neil Stewart couldn't afford a proper projector. Look at the size of this projector. Look, it's, it's running on Caligas thing. Uh, it's got a big fence around it here. Um, this, is, this is a picture uh, by Valesque, uh, Diego Valesque. It was painted in 1656. Really interesting picture. It's called Las Maninas. Anybody, won't, who, any, anybody uh, know what Las Maninas means? Put your hand if you know. There's a prize, holiday for two in Barbados. Yes. <laughs> I'm the other one, yes, I <laughs> still want to answer. <laughs> Last minute, it means the little princesses, okay, and uh, here, here are the little princesses here. Um, it's an interesting picture, uh, it's, uh, has anybody seen this live? It's one of, the, one of the, put your hand if you've seen it, it's fantastic, isn't it? It's one of the five best pictures in the world. Uh, it's huge, it's about ten feet tall, I don't know, God knows, eight feet wide, it's a really big picture, Unusual because, remember, this was painted in uh, 1656 when you couldn't go to the art shop and buy a canvas. You had to weave the canvas and getting something woven this wide and this long was very unusual. And the colours, are it, this doesn't do it justice, but the colours are very rich. There's lots of, lots of blues in it and blue was a very difficult colour to do. You couldn't go to the art shop and buy some paint in a tube. You, know, you used to have to make it all up. And so blue was a very hard uh, colour to make. And, um, of course, it represents the, the great wealth of the Spanish court. Um, there's the wet nurse here. Here's the chamberlain in the doorway. Interesting story about him, but I, I haven't got time to do that. And here is a big mastiff dog, you can see, which is a symbol. It's, it's uh, a symbol of the power and wealth of the Spanish royal family. And uh, here is uh, the little princess. And, and you think, OK, well, what's this? Who's this here? Well, actually, you see, this picture is not about the little princesses. This picture is about the guy who painted it. This is a self-portrait. This is actually the guy here. I know you probably can't see that at the back. I hate it when people come to conferences and say, I know you can't see this at the back. Don't sit at the back. You know, come early. This is a picture. <laughs> this is a picture. This is actually Velasque himself. Beautiful flowing moustache. Uh, with another canvas. You see, another big canvas in the corner. What's he done? Well, it, what this is, is an advert. It's an advert for Valesque saying, I paint huge canvases, which are very expensive, using very expensive paint of the royal family. We'll do that again. Of the royal family. That's right, you've got it. So, I, I, Jesus, what a big cheese I am. But there's an even a little more secret in there. If you look here, it looks like there's a picture hanging on the wall. It's not a picture hanging on the wall at all. It's a mirror. Can you imagine how expensive a mirror was in the 1600s? And reflected in the mirror, you can see the king and queen of Spain. So he's not painting Las Maninas. He's painting this way. You are in the position of the sitter. He's painting the king and queen of Spain. It's a fascinating picture full of... um, Uh, mystery and secrets and I haven't got time to go into it. Now here's another picture here. This is Las Maninas painted by Picasso in 1957. It's in a dull monochrome. The wealth of the court is reduced to a sausage dog. 
the little princess looks like she's fallen off the top of a wedding cake. Uh, Velasquez himself, if you see his face, he's cut his face in half and he's looking at himself. He's saying, Velasquez is an arrogant man. He's full of himself. He's up himself. And here, the royal family, we all know what Picasso thought of the royal family, is painted them as clowns. This is full of a different kind of meaning. Really interesting, painted in the monochrome. What's going on here? Well, this is Picasso. Picasso could paint beautifully. He could paint at least as well as Velasque. He, and he was painting like that when he was 17, but as he grew older, he did different things. And this is Picasso doing that to the art establishment. He's saying, I can do chocolate box, I can do adverts, but I do meaning. Now, what does this mean for us? Why have I showed you this? Well, I think it's a fabulous metaphor for where we are with the NHS. The NHS is a beautiful thing. It was conceived on the 5th of July, 1948, out of austerity in the post-war years by a government who had no money but wanted to have a health service that worked for its people. And it went into debt to do it. And it produced the finest health service in the world. Wherever I go in the world, I'm off to Canada soon, I'm in Portugal next week, talking about the NHS, they all want to know how we do it. But it's not a Velasque NHS anymore. It's a Picasso NHS. It's recognisable, but only just. This is the difficulty we face. Not just if we're midwives, everyone is facing it. Now here's the situation. I'm going to talk money for a moment. Now I know you don't want me to talk money. You want to talk about babies and blood and stitches and oh God. <laughs> but I'm, I'm going to talk about money. In 2010, when the coalition government was trying to rescue the nation from the banking crisis, it cut all the services. It cut everything. Cut social services by 40%. We were lucky, we got a 1% increase. 1% a year against 4% growth for five years. It absolutely hobbled the NHS. Between 2010 and 2015, it was a really difficult time. The gap was 20 billion. The NHS managed to find 18 billion and carried forward two billion pounds worth of debt into the next financial period, which was 2015 to 2020. That's the period we're in now. Now, there's an argument over the eight billion pounds or the 10 billion pounds, but over the next spending cycle, the funding is more or less another flat line. So we will have had 10 years of flat line funding against 4% growth each year. We need to think about that. We need to think about what that's doing to the service, what it's doing to training, what it's doing to our ability to cope. And you'll get a lot of people who will stand on a stage like me and they'll stand in front of you and they'll say, do you know, the NHS has to change. And they do that little bouncy thing. The NHS has to change. This is the bouncy, I know every bloody thing. Don't argue with me. I've worked it out. NHS has to change. It's body language, it's called anchoring. People anchor, you watch today when people are speaking. Don't tell them I told you. But when they're not sure, they anchor. They say, we must. We will. But I don't know how. And they stick their ass out, don't they? And it has to change. Right. It's because they're talking out of their ass. They haven't got a clue. <laughs> they haven't got a clue. So when anyone stands on the stage like this and says, the NHS has to change, I want you to do something for me. I'm grooming audiences. I'm hypnotizing you now. Whatever you hear, the NHS has to change. You shout, how? Right, we'll have a practice. We'll do the good look inside first. Right, here we go. <laughs> The NHS has to change. Ah. That's right, now we do the beautiful people. <laughs> the NHS has to change. Ah. 
now I'm going to show you we're much more powerful if we work together. Here we go. The NHS has to change. Oh, Jesus, I love that. Do it again. The NHS has to change. And again. And again. And yes, keep asking how. When people stand and say the NHS has to change, I want you to ask how. That was one too many, love. <laughs> Don't get excited. <laughs> Free at the point of use. Young or old, rich or poor, drug addict or granny, we'll scoop you up, pick you up, get you back on your feet and get you home again as soon as we can. What's not to like? What's to change? Blimey, the pub's open. <laughs> you all right, love? Listen, take my advice. Don't drink coffee before lunchtime. The NHS, do, do you want to come and do this? Or sorry, it's up to you. The NHS has to change, they say, don't they? The NHS has to change? Exactly. They don't know. What they're talking about is the money. If we're not careful, this is what will happen. They say, oh, I think we should have top-ups. I think we should pay to go and see the GP. I think if you're drunk, you should pay 20 pounds. Mate, I've spent 20 pounds getting drunk. I ain't got another 20 pounds. I think if you don't attend, you should have to pay. Oh, really? How much? How are you going to get it? You know? And let's think about it. Take your taxes out of your right-hand pocket. Take your top-ups out of your left-hand pocket. Still your trousers. You still have to pay one way or the other. And that's the danger. That is the danger we're facing. Because now there's lots of conferences and lots of people talking about, is the NHS sustainable? Of course it is sustainable. It's sustainable for as long as we want to pay for it. In the year 2000, we were putting 6.3% of our gross domestic product into funding the NHS. 6.3. Next year, we will be putting 6.6% of our GDP into running the NHS. 16 years. We've gone backwards. And that's the problem we face. So I don't want to change the NHS, but I want to change how the NHS does the NHS. Because it isn't any good, I don't think, I really don't, with the greatest respect to every, all, every activist that there may be here. I don't see the point of making, uh, you know, cutting the head off the broom and making another placard and walking down Whitehall saying we want this and we want that. They're not listening. May is not interested. The great May might is more interested in Brexit than the NHS. We are stuck where we are. We have to be more nimble. We have to be more innovative. We have to ask ourselves some tough questions. We have to ask ourselves tough questions before tough questions are asked of us. Because people will say, do you know what? The NHS was set up for people who were sick and ill and injured. Having a baby is a condition. Midwives are always telling us we can't medicate having a baby. No, you do with the NHS. No, no. Do it all in the front room. Okay, fine. If it's nothing to do with the NHS, you can pay to have a baby, it'll be three grand. That's the danger. That's what you need to think about. Would they do that? No. Damn right they would. They've got to balance the books. We've got a very uncertain future. You see, I'm going to confide in you something now that I wouldn't normally do. But I know you're not ones to gossip. I was born before the NHS. Now, normally, audiences go, gosh, no, Roy. <laughs> Sorry. So wake up, you dozy lot. Here we go, right. I was born before the NHS. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> I was born uh, in the east end of London. You couldn't tell, could you? My dad was a window cleaner. My mum was a shop worker. My dad had to save up the equivalent of three weeks' wages so that my mum could have a woman who wasn't a midwife come in and help her give birth to me. For my mum lost her first baby. She was a woman at risk. She should have gone to hospital. She didn't. She nearly bled to death first time round. But it, she spent 12 hours in labour, 
no gas, no air. She said, Roy, it was worth every minute. <laughs> Sorry, Mom. <laughs> and I was born. Two years later, the then Labour government introduced the NHS, and it took off the shoulders of working people the worry and anxiety of midwifery, accident, illness, and it was the most defining thing that politicians have ever done. And now we are faced with the problems we're faced with. What will midwifery look like? Will midwifery look like midwifery looks now in 2020, 2025? It seems a long way away. Some of you will be retired. Some of you will be married, having kids. Some of you will be all still coming to conferences watching me talk in a wheelchair because I'm not giving up. It's a long way away, but what is midwifery going to look like? How will you lead your profession? You are 3,500 midwives short, we think. We don't really know. What will Brexit mean? Some midwives might get sent home. Immigrants will stop coming here. The birth rate may fall. We might have too many midwives. We don't know. We need to do some proper work on how many midwives we want. Do we have to have a midwife at every birth? Oh! <gasps> Now let me tell you, ladies, if I was going to give birth, I would want to be in hospital with all the machines that go beep, the chief midwife standing next to me, five consultants, and God knows how many nurses. I would want the Monty. But I know it's not like that. And I'm just teasing you. But you know, if you go to Holland and look at the Birdsog model of community care, you've got district nurses and healthcare assistants that take over a whole co cohort of patients and look after them at home. Is there a role for the Birdsog model in midwifery? What does it look like? Birdsog, make a note of it. Today's learning, write this down, I'll spell it for you. I can only do this once. It's B-U-U-R-T-Z-O-R-G, Birdsog. It's not a midwifery model, but there's something to learn. What does the future of midwifery look like? Can we keep on recruiting midwives? Will people still come into the profession? Will they still want to do it? Will people share the sense of vocation that you've got? I don't know. The extent to which midwifery survives is the extent to which midwifery can see its future. And it won't be the same. Nothing will be the same. All I can say to you is this. The NHS survives because people want it to survive. And since 1948, we in the professions, people with vocation and a sense of belonging, have handed the NHS from generation to generation. It's your turn now. It's your turn to be reflective, to look at your practice, your service design, the things that you do, how you go about your trade, how you develop your profession, and how you hand it on. You are the link between the past and the future. If you're not going to do it, who will? And when people like me say what I'm going to say and stand on the stage and say this, it sounds hollow and plastic. But I mean this sincerely. Thank you for what you do. Thank you for what you do in the most demanding and difficult of circumstances and the pressures that you work under and the responsibilities that you have and the courage that you've got to carry them every day into the workplace. Thank you. And I want you to do something for me. Will you stand up? Will you face that way? And would you give the person in front of you a pat on the back and say, bloody well done! <laughs> and will you keep standing, please? Will you keep standing? Because... 
I speak all over the world to audiences. It's my great privilege to do it. Thank you for inviting me, but I just tell you, this is your chance to make an old man very happy because when I've spoken in Earl's Court before, I've never had a standing ovation. Thank you. <laughs> I know he's a geezer, he's got more hair on his chin than he has on his head. That's okay. Oh, hello, Ron. Oh, God. Uh, <laughs> uh, my name's Billy, I'm a senior midwifery student at Sorry, King's. Sorry, hold the microphone a little bit further away from you, because it's, uh, it's fuzzy. Yeah, your, your name is Billy? Yeah, I'm a Correct. Senior, senior midwifery student at King's College. King's uh, College. And I have a question. Uh, you, yeah. you were said at the beginning of your speech about the NHS being renowned all over the world for yeah. being the best. Yes. So when you're asking people to respond to, uh, to people saying that the NHS has to change, shouldn't we be saying why, not how? <laughs> if it's already the best? Well, listen, you, you, you do the why, I'll do the how. I don't care. We sound, <laughs> we sound like a tribe of Indians, don't we? Big Chief why and Big Chief how. You're absolutely right. Listen, the NHS, um, listen, it's not perfect. We know that. Midwifery gets itself into some terrible tangles and there's some been horrible scandals and things do go wrong. And when they go wrong in the NHS, it go, they go badly wrong because we deal with people's lives, hopes, dreams, families. It can go badly wrong. But as far as the NHS systems are concerned around the world, there's a great book, uh, Second Learning Point, Dr. Mark Bricknell's point, book on international healthcare comparisons. It's very, uh, very easy read. Um, the, 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 there is no question about it. The NHS, is, the NHS system is the best in the world. It's envied everywhere I go. It's the, because it's socialised medicine. Taxes are collected, redistributed, um, on a, a, and then we will have free health care. So it's a bit like a big insurance company, really. We syndicate the, the, the risks. So that, that's why it is uh, the envy of the world. Most, uh, most countries don't do that. They have a mixture of mixed economy on the supply side or whatever, it gets very complicated. France, for example, as though any of you have been to France, been ill in France, is a top-up thing which is very complicated to reclaim. They, they are in fact now getting rid of that. Germany is looking at its systems as well to move it closer to our system because it's simpler and it's cheaper to run. As far as outcomes are concerned, well, you know, it, it's very difficult. If you look at cancer outcomes, well, they say that, you know, some people say our cancer outcomes are the best in the world, some people say they aren't. The interesting thing is the data is collected by a thing called Eurostat across Europe, and the data is collected in European countries on a different basis. So we're not exactly comparing apples with apples, we're comparing apples with light bulbs. But um, by and large, um, you know, pick a country, if you're going to be ill, where do you want to be? Well, America, if you're rich. Yeah? If you're not, no place like home. Mm. Hi. Uh, my name's Don't Pippa. Know. I'm a community midwife from Epsom. Um, I've been a midwife for 10 years and I've done various different jobs. Um, but one of the things I've noticed mostly in the NHS is that it's going to go bankrupt using prophylaxis as, Just as a stop, treatment. Just stop, 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 because uh, there's a little technical thing because there's no fold back on the stage and I can't hear you. So I'm going to come down here and stand in front of the... And now I can hear you, right. I, f I feel that the NHS is going to go bankrupt using prophylaxis as treatment rather than individually caring for people. And we're doing a lot of damage by treating people with things that they don't need rather than investing in more staff to, to be able to care for these people and use other methods. Give me a for instance. For instance, um, in, in one of my biggest bugbears in midwifery is Group B strep. I find that... Don't ask me about midwifery. No, I'm not asking you about it, but I'm explaining course, my no. biggest bugbear is the fact that we give a lot of antibiotics to women um, and babies that are prophylactic, so just in case. I get it, yeah. And I feel that... Okay, I, I, I get it. Not cutting you short, but I want to get as many questions as I can. Don't think me rude. I, the answer is I don't know. I mean, the, my question would be, if I was still running a hospital and somebody came to me and said, we don't want to do this anymore, I'd say, what would happen if we didn't do it? What would happen to infection rates? What would happen to outcomes if we didn't do it? So the question to ask is, we're doing this now. Do we need to do it? The sensible question is, what would happen if we didn't do it? But I agree with you. There are probably lots of areas where the NHS could be more effective, it could be more efficient. 
There's no question about that. And wherever you work, I'm absolutely sure you could point to waste and things that could be done more efficiently. As you know, I run the Academy of Fabulous Stuff. It's full of really bright ideas from the front line. So there are lots of things we can do, but remember this. It costs £2 billion a week to run the NHS. £2 billion a week to run the NHS. And making a dent is that is very tricky. Not a great answer to your question, but I thought in the circumstances, it's the best I could do. Give me a better question. Different question. Give me one I can answer. Yes, lady in blue, lilac. Is that blue or lilac, darling? Um, yeah, whatever. Yes. It's a fuchsia. <laughs> Is it a fuchsia? What do you think? If I do this. Is it a hyacinth? <laughs> Is it? Hello, I'm, I'm in Georgina. Jakarta, as you can tell. Come on, what's yeah. your name? What's Georgina, your name? Georgina. How do you do, Georgina? Yeah. Where do you I work, do. darling? I lied. Allied? Allied nursing. It's oh, agency. Right. Very nice to see you. Yeah. Where are you from? I'm from originally from no, Ghana. No, not originally. You're here now. Where do you live? Yeah, I live in North Chim. North Chim? Yeah. It's posh, isn't it? <laughs> I tell you what, I bet she's making a few quid. Go on, yeah. I just want to know how will you answer that question yourself? The NHS has to change. And yeah. You see how? What do you think yourself? Okay, what I do, here's what I do. Make a note. Here's today's learning. First thing I would do is I would merge NHS England with the Department of Health. They waste a fortune. I would then move primary care into NHS improvement and then over the time I would move the CQC into NHS improvement so we only got two large regulators. On top of that I will ban CQC inspections because they don't make any difference. <laughs> <laughs> And I would use data to analyse people's outcomes and use it to forecast outcomes and I go where the hot spots were. I give uh, all the nurses a 10% poke. No, 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 no. <laughs> 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 uh, so, and I would put a lot more money into public health. I'd start teaching kids at school. It's fun and it's a lot happier to be healthy. Last question. Got one more. Have I finished? There's a question yes. here. Oh, there's a lady over there. Okay. We're coming. I like this. We should do more of this. Yeah, we Hang can on. Do. Wait for me. Don't start without me. Yeah. Stand up. Stand up. That's it. I'm loving the hair. Yeah. Do you think you could do me? What do you think? Any chance? <laughs> What's your name? Sorry, my name is Shirley. Sorry. I'm... That's not a very nice name. It's a... This is Sorry Shirley. So give her a round of applause. My name is Shirley. <laughs> Don't laugh. I'm no, you can't answer a question if you're laughing, can you? You can't do it. You've started now. You've got the giggles, haven't you? Right, OK. My name is Shirley. Oh, I'm, done that. I'm not a midwife. I'm a health visitor. Oh, excuse me. You're yeah. rare. You need to take your photograph. There's not many of you left. This is very off-putting, but still. Um, in response to, I think it was Billy across there, and you followed that up about um, uh, the NHS is renowned around the world. Hmm. How would you deal with health tourism? Because the health service seemed to have a problem in, you know, in accounting. Okay, in health China. tourism. I'm, no, it's fine. Yeah. Health tourism, I get that. Uh, there's a report this morning, I hope you've all read it. It's from the Public Accounts Committee, where the NHS is thoroughly lambasted for not collecting the amount that it's due when people turn up here and bring their woes into A&E. What are we supposed to do? What do you do working in A&E? You've got 19 ambulances on the run. You've got A&E that looks like the First World War, people being stacked up in broom cupboards. Somebody comes in who doesn't speak English very well with a broken arm. You say, would you mind just hanging on, please? Would you pop home and get an electricity bill on your passport so we can be sure we can treat you? Thank you. You're going to do that? What are you going to do when a lady turns up in hospital? Like she did, there's a Nigerian lady who flew into here under the 23 weeks limit. She, uh, she started to deliver early. She went to, I think it was UCLH or King's or somewhere like that. The babies were very poorly, very tiny, in intensive care. She ran up a bill of a quarter of a million quid. She said, I didn't even intend to stay in London. I was on my way to the United States. I haven't got a quarter of a million quid. What shall I do? She would say, well, look, stuff the babies back in and go and have them somewhere else. <laughs> I mean, what are you supposed to do? Listen, we aren't the border agency. 
That's not our job. Our job is to look after people. We're humanitarians. We have a strong sense of vocation. We look after people. If people shouldn't be here, that's the border agency. You know where this is going, I'll tell you where this is going. Where this is going is identity cards. You will be issued with an identity card. Now, they have them in Portugal and Spain still. They still use them. Here, we've decided we don't want to do that. But there is no certain way of someone coming into our services and you say to them, you know, they, they don't look like us. They have a brown skin and a foreign accent, you know, but actually they live in Islington and they're a teacher. Or they have a funny ginger beard and white skin and, you know, they're from Helsinki. People still come from Helsinki, I think they do, yeah. Helsinki, you know. Are they entitled to health care? You look at a passport. Look at a migrant's right to remain. There are 17, I think I'm right, 17 different levels of right to remain. How are you supposed to figure that out? It's not our job. Of course we don't, this is not the international health service, it's a national health service, and people should pay. And if we suspect someone isn't paying when they should, then we should bring it to the attention of the management, your line manager, and say, I think this person needs to have a look at. And even if they turn up with a passport, and even if they've got an electricity bill, it doesn't mean to say it's not their brother's electricity bill. You can't prove the fact, even if they're living here, you can't prove whether or not they're entitled to health care. It's a much more complicated thing. Access to a national insurance number might help, but the Data Protection Act stops that happening. Listen, let's not drive ourselves balmy with this. This is not an NHS problem. The NHS is going to have to deal with a solution, but the solution lies in Parliament and at the border agency. Don't beat yourself up. Look after people. That's what you're trained for. I think that might be a good way to end, Martin. Okay. Great I to be with you all. Thank you for having me. <laughs>